Hi, welcome to the show. My name is Jesse Goldberg, and my guest today is Jeff Mobley, uh, the guy, uh, a state's lawyer, states and wills and all that kind of stuff. That's close enough. This Thank is your you. third appearance. I know. Your third appearance on this show. But you've been on it 650 times, so I've got I a have. ways to go. That's true. So we're going to talk today about a little bit about music because we want to find out what what kind of a, a state planning a musician should do. I mean, everybody should have a state planning, but but what kind of a state planning a, mi a musician should do in particular. Is there anything you can think of right off the bat that a musician would need or a songwriter would need that a normal person wouldn't need? Yes, there's lots of stuff that musicians, songwriters, people in the music business need to make sure they have in their state planning. But that misses the main point. The main point is they need to do estate planning. I don't know if you right. know. You see uh, cases in the paper about uh, performers or artists who end up in a conservatorship because they didn't have powers of attorney or revocable trust. You read about court battles after death and will contests and estate contests because they don't have the right trust or wills in place. So it's really important to establish at the beginning that they need to do good, solid estate planning and then blend in the extra special stuff related to music business. So what would be the first thing you do? Somebody come to your office and they've, they've had um, a bunch of song hits and um, uh, what would you say the first thing to do is? Well, you really treat it like any other asset that's hard to value illiquid, Very you can't turn it into cash really, and that requires special management. It's almost like a business. If someone comes in and they want to leave their business to their family, you have to put in a lot of special thought and consideration and special provisions. And that's what your music catalog is or whatever it is that you have so it's as like a an performer ongoing business. Artist. So how would you do that? Uh, say you want to do give your your songs to one person and give the administration to another person because you don't you want the income to go to somebody but you want the administration to go to, you don't trust that person that you're giving the income the income to you just gave the answer in your question you need a trust that's what by definition what a trust is you give the management and control to one person we call it a trustee but the beneficiary the recipient of the income stream or the financial uh, benefits of those assets are your family members, the beneficiaries, and that's the classic definition of a trust. What if the, the trustee was one of the beneficiaries also? Can that be done? That can be done. Often it's done that you'll have one of the beneficiaries, maybe the husband or wife or one of the children as a trustee or a co-trustee, but you've really got to focus. Again, think about it as a business. If you had a bakery and you left it to your family, you want to make sure that you've appointed someone that knows how to run a bakery. Your family may not know anything about baked goods. Well, right. your family may not know anything about how to manage and exploit those music-related assets. So often you will have a co-trustee or a special trustee or a co-executor that has expertise in that area. Well, is there any kind of a thing, a device where you can leave sort of like a life estate to the beneficiary in, in a song, say your songs. Say you wanted to have a song, you wanted to give a life estate to that person to get the income from the song while they're alive, and then give it to somebody else after, after they die. Yes, you can do that, but you want to do it inside of a trust. A life estate is a little clunky and archaic. The concept is right, Jesse. You want to decide who gets the income for this period of time, perhaps for someone's life, and then at their death, you want to give it to other people or just distribute it outright. That's what a trust does. Okay, so that would be the way to do it then? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Um, so the it's, other it's thing, a irrevocable trust or well, revocable it's, trust? It's revocable because you're not dead yet. It, while you're alive, it's revocable. Right. And you still control it and you can revoke it. But at, after your death, it's irrevocable it can't be changed. It, right. So it is it is what it is. Okay. That's what I'll do then. How many songs have you got to put in that trust? <laughs> well, you never know. They're very hard to value. Right. They are. And they're very illiquid. Yours especially, right? Uh, 
Yes. <laughs> okay, so so what is, starting from the beginning, somebody comes to your, your office and you, again, would you recommend a will and a trust inside the will? Is that how it works? I would recommend that if they're an artist or entertainer, that they have a revocable living trust and what's called a pour over will to go with it. The pour over will just says, I leave whatever I have to my trust. So the trust is the main document. And that's real important. Um, have you ever seen a copy of Elvis Presley's will? No. Well, you can get one just by contacting the probate clerk down in Shelby County in Memphis. Um, What's it look like? It's a, it's a very simple document. Did he do it on LegalZoom.com? Leaves it to Lisa <laughs> Marie in trust till she's age 21 or something. And uh, I, met, I know the lawyer who was his executor and handled all that. But the point is, who wants that publicity? Who wants the world to know what you said in your will? When you have a revocable living trust, it doesn't get filed at the courthouse when you die. All these inquiring minds that want to know won't know what it says. Well, somebody rips it up, though. I mean, and that's a little de more than well. Well, anybody could rip up a will, but we're going to keep you advise, a copy. Let's just on the subject, off the subject for a second. What do you advise people do see if they hire you as a lawyer? As a lawyer uh, then you give them a copy of whatever the documents you make up for them, right? At the end of the process, I don't keep the original will. I give it to the client. And they always ask me, where should I keep my original right. will? And the number one answer is in a safety deposit box at a bank if you have one. The number two answer is in some fireproof safe or box at home. And the number three answer is next to the frozen peas. Why next to the, oh, in the refrigerator? Yeah. Right. So, um, but you don't keep a copy of that yeah, will? Yeah, I keep a copy. If, the, if somebody takes that will and destroys it, is your copy of the trust and will provable in the court? It's is, is provable, there? but you got to go to a little extra effort. I mean, you don't want the original to go lost on you. You want right. to hopefully secure it in a safe place. Right. So what, um, somebody like Elvis who makes more money dead than alive, I mean, does that cover all the stuff that Lisa Marie would be still getting? Right. Well, you know, I think they put everything in something called Elvis Presley Enterprises or something. But th that's the point. When you die and you're an entertainer or artist, you don't want, if you've got five children, you don't want them each to own one-fifth of all your, your copyrights, all your assets, all your songs. You would want them to be managed and owned as a unity by one person as a right. trustee, and then that can be exploited, and then they can get the money. That can be divided, but you don't, you want to avoid having to divide the assets, and that's why a trust is the perfect vehicle to do right. that. Right, I see, that's a good idea. The, um, if somebody owns the uh, assets, what if the person is no longer alive when the, uh, the trustee is no longer alive? Well, you build in a batting order. You know, right now, uh, I think Matt Hasselback is the number one quarterback and Jake Locker is the okay. second string quarterback. And when you write a will or a trust, you list your first string trustee right. and you list your second string and sometimes a third string, those kind of things. Right, okay. Well, any other uh, particular music problems that don't pertain to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, what people need to understand when they have music related assets is number one, they need to have good estate planning, they need to have a good solid laundry list of specific powers that they give their executor or trustee, not just the general powers you would leave, leave an executor in a simple will. There's so uh, many complicated rules now about the copyright laws the family's right to terminate copyrights, right. all these things. So you want to give your trustee or executor a lot of specific powers. You want to pick the right executor or trustee. You just don't want, you know, you don't want it to be karaoke night. You don't want it to have amateurs trying to do a professional job. Right. Right. So when you just let your family members do it, oftentimes, you're going to have the karaoke experience of managing your business, your music business. And the other thing, sometimes you've also got to watch out, 
and I'll lose uh, points uh, with my banking brethren for this, but when you have a corporate trustee, when you have a bank trust department, that makes it hard for them to manage those type of assets. They feel pressured to have traditional assets that they can invest in stocks and bonds and earn interest and dividends. And to manage a business or a music portfolio is difficult for them. So again, if you were gonna use that type of trustee, and there's good reasons to do that, you still want to have maybe a co-trustee or a special trustee just for the music related so assets. So what kind of money do they get for being trustees? They must get something, is that written into they the They have a standard planning? fee schedule and it's. But what if it's somebody that you pick? Somebody that you pick, it just depends. It can be negotiated. If it's someone that you were using while you were alive to well, help what if you, they don't like even a manager. Know you, what if they don't even know you picked them? Well, that's, hopefully they'll agree to do it when they find out by surprise. But if you have picked your accountant or music, an entertainment lawyer, they've got their standard hourly rates. You know, it's gonna be, I think, fair. Uh, at the end of the day, the point is, if they're good, they're worth the money. Right. Okay. Okay, what's next on this list here? Now we got done with what I, what I need to know about. You gonna show my book? Well, yeah, well, we'll see. I gotta get my free legal advice before I did anything. Okay. <laughs> Let's go, let me show this book. This is a Pritchard, Pritchard on Wills and Administration of Estates. Can we get a close up of this? By Jack Robinson, Jeff Mobley, and Andra. An Andra Hendrick. 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 Now, this is, what do they use? The, is this the form? There's a form book over there. Is this, is this what, what book? What's this, in this is book? like a horn book. Oh, nice. Horn book. That's is it a law in a school. Book? Your law school days are coming out. Yeah, it is a, a digest, a legal digest. It's like an encyclopedia of Tennessee law on wills and estates. Judges quote it in their opinions, lawyers quote it when they're appearing before court, and people use it as, a, lawyers use it as a research tool. So this is the Tennessee, uh, the, this, is the, this is the guide for the Tennessee estate lawyers. Yeah, there's one volume on wills, and there's another volume on handling estates, and then the third volume is forms. Forms, right. So do you update this? We concept? update it every year. Have you put it on disk? I mean, it's computer? on disk, it's on CD-ROM, it's on the internet, it's the whole right. kit and caboodle. What do you think about the legal Zoom thing kind of thing? You hear that, that O.J. Simpson's lawyer, what's his name again? Robert Shapiro. Yeah. Comes on all the time, LegalZoom.com for a will you for $70 or something like that. It's a pay me now or pay me later. I mean, go ahead and use legal Zoom. You're going to mess it up. And then the family will have to pay me a lot more money to fix it later. Right. Um, and the other thing is you don't have a lawyer. I mean, you don't have someone to ask for advice. And there's no uh, planning, really. It's right. Just people people uh, come to me with these great ideas about what they want to say in their will. And if they were doing it at home on their own, I'm sure they would say exactly what they're telling me. Often that's very impractical or very expensive right. or will lead to all kinds of court battles to say it the way they want to say it. What's the best way to be flexible in a will? So if, if you have more assets coming in, so you know, say you're 60 years old when you're ready to get a will, but you don't die till you're 80 years old, and you have more assets coming up, but you don't want to keep changing your will every five minutes, what's the best way to be flexible about that? To deal in generalities, just to say, I leave whatever it is I have, in more legal terminology than that, to my f wife or All to my, my intellectual children and property, shares. something like that. Yeah, we define that. Right. in the document, but you can't list every asset. You'd be changing your will every week as right. your assets change. Right, so you just be general about it. Right. And there's some, what if the beneficiaries die? There's, there's provisions yeah, for that. Yeah, you, you've got to cover all the what ifs. What if this child dies? Does their share go to their children? Does it come back to the other children? Do I want to prevent this inheritance from being taken by an ex-spouse in a divorce or to protect it from lawsuits. There's a lot that we, we do right. behind the scenes that Shapiro is not going to help you <laughs> with oh, yeah. with LegalZoom.com. <laughs> um, now, as far as a state, the state tax, which is still in, you know, we still have the death tax, right? Um, how do they value things like um, copyrights and things like that? Well, it's basically based on the income stream. 
you know, what, what did these songs, these works produce every year for the last three to five years? And you come up with kind of an average amount per year and then you multiply that by a right. multiple. I assume that's really the same way that when you would do it something. if you sold your catalog right. today. Right, but if, if you do it in a trust, an irrevocable trust, that would probably pass outside the will, right? I mean, pass outside the evaluation of the estate tax. Yeah, if you gave it away now in an irrevocable trust. When you, is that subject to the, the $15,000 a year or for 13th, whatever it is, gift tax thing? There is a federal gift tax, but this year you can give more than $13,000 per loved one. You can give 13000 per loved one and up to $5.12 million away just with no year. federal gift tax, just this year. Next year, that extra amount over the 13000 a year goes down to $1 million. So you can give a million dollars away? Over your lifetime, and then you have you over your, used up your okay. exemption for, and, for and that you don't person? have it at your debt. No, to anybody. To anybody. Okay, so if you give it a revocable, or irrevocable trust to somebody for in a normal year, if it's any more than the estate, the gift tax part, you the have thirteen to pay, thousand. A you year. have to pay the gift tax on it. No, you just start using up your lifetime exemption, which this year is five point one two million. Okay. Next year, one million. Okay. All right, I almost understand that. Okay, <laughs> and you 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 didn't ask, but I'll tell you. Okay, Tennessee has now abolished its gift tax. There is no Tennessee gift tax, as of last year and all years prior to that. There was a annoying little Tennessee gift tax when you gave more than thirteen thousand dollars a year. Now there is no gift tax, and Tennessee is phasing out its inheritance tax. It's one million this year, the exemption. 1.25 million next year, then uh, two million, then five million, and then 2016, there is no Tennessee inheritance tax. Well, that's just what the federal government did until it got to the point when in 2010 there was no tax, and 2011 it came back again. It came back. Right. It came back. Yeah, I, I personally don't think it's a it's proper to tax somebody. Like that, because like when George Steinbrenner died, you know, he died just in the year when there would be no tax. But if he died, the Yankees worth billions of a billion dollars or something, they would have had to sell the Yankees or something like that in order to pay the estate tax. That's not right. You sound like a Yankee fan. Of course, I'm a Yankee fan. <laughs> 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 but you're right. It should. It's totally unfair that whether a family really is devastated by having to sell the family business, the family farm, right. within nine months of the date of death to raise millions of dollars in taxes. It's unfair that whether that has terrible thing has to happen or not depends on the year of right. death. Well, the 50, right now, I heard it was 55, owns 55% this year or something. That's ridiculous, 55%? A, a guy works all his life and then he dies and they take 55% from the family he wants to give it to? Right. That's it's 35% right. this year, it's going back to 55% right. next unless year. Unless they change it. Right. Which they're thinking about changing. Right. It's still too much, it shouldn't be given away. Right. And with all my millions and stuff, I'm like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 do we, uh, what else have we talked about that, that's on this thing here? Well. Um, I want to talk about powers of attorney because sometimes okay. they're overlooked. Um, we're all living too long now. I know it, that doesn't sound right. Uh, everybody wants to live forever, but we're, our minds aren't living as long as our bodies, so to speak. We're, almost everyone right. I know is running into not just a few weeks of incapacity prior to death, but months and years. And if you don't have uh, financial powers of attorney in place, durable general powers of attorney in place, your family has to go to probate court and get a conservator appointed. And that is a nightmare for anyone. It's, if you have to have a conservator, the probate court does the best job it can do and is sensitive to the family's issues, but it's just a very imperfect instrument to deal with that problem. It's costly, it's public, um, you can have some unexpected outcomes. What about powers of attorney <clears throat> for people who, you know, are not on death's door, but they're, 
they're unhealthy and all of a sudden, you know, your, your health can change like that, you know? So what about powers of attorney for people who are <coughs> relatively young? <coughs> and, right. And you just about to see collapse. about that cough, Jesse. Yeah, that's the point. Everyone should have a durable general power of attorney, not just right. uh, the elderly in nursing homes. Right. Everyone should have it. And I mean, I could drop dead uh, or have a stroke or something, and I, I wouldn't be able to do anything. Right. Um, it's, I see the hard cases every day of people being, becoming disabled unexpectedly. Right. Uh, the, you know, bad things happen to good people. And part of what you should do for your family is have a power of attorney in place. People overlook that. They want to talk about wills and trusts and all the fancy stuff. But they need the powers of attorney. Right. The powers of attorney over health uh, issues, too. Yes, they should have a health care power also? of attorney. Yes, they okay. should have a health care power of attorney. They should have a financial power of attorney. And they should have a living will. Okay, so one is called a durable power of attorney. Which one is that? Both the health care and the financial power of attorney are durable. Okay. Durable meaning? That it will stay in effect if you become incompetent. Right. So that's why you want it in the first place. You want it right. to be durable. Right. Well, that's good advice. I but have one of those from my mother. And it's important. Yeah, I do. And also somebody else has one for me. Oh, okay. See, I'm, I'm on top of things. Do you know, they could be at your bank in the morning drawing all the money out. Uh, that, I hit it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about um, artists, songwriters, and let me say, they're great people to work with. They're quirky and funny and creative and nice. He's describing me. That's just describing me right now. <laughs> quirky, creative, nice. Yeah. I'm not so nice. But you need to keep good records. Now, you know, left brain people, creative people aren't always good record keepers. But your executor, your trustee, your family needs to be able to make sure they can find all the different publishing companies and all the different all the different songs. A yeah. lot of people throw songs in drawers and they, they're gone, you know. And as you know, you know, a song, the song Unforgettable was forgotten for decades until Natalie Cole we constructed it, right. that electronic duet with her deceased father and all of a sudden it becomes Song of the Year. But that was, one, that was a song that was, can be traced to, 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 uh, to the publishing company because it was actually out, but there's a lot of songs that don't get out. There might be some Vincent Van Goghs out there who don't get famous until they die. Right, but the point is you want to have it in a trust, it seems to me, so it can be exploited. You don't know when a song will get picked up or when it will be resuscitated, be used in a movie. You know how all this works. Right, right. Uh, and uh, everybody, you know, what is the rule about nostalgia, you know? About every Every year, what was hot 20 years before all of a sudden becomes in vogue again, you know, because the people are old enough to get nostalgic about it. Right. Like baseball cards. Right. <laughs> and you were at a baseball card show. Right. That's where I saw you just recently. But I was there to look for basketball cards. I like basketball better than baseball. And your, uh, your era for basketball that you... Uh, the... 1960s and 70s, the ABA, the red, white, oh, and blue really? ball. Yeah, I remember them. There was, um, you know, the first basketball card, while we're on the subject, was in 1958, Tops. It was an 80-card set. And Bob Cousy was in it, Bill Russell was in it, uh, Bill Sharman was in it. Um, wow. And we used to have that set. You really had yeah, that we had, set? Yeah, we had two of them, but they, they're gone, though. We know, we, they... We call it the baseball card holocaust at our house, you know, <laughs> and they all got thrown out. So by your mother? Actually, my father did it. Uh oh. Actually, my father did it with my permission. My brothers were away at college, and they were older than me. My father said, "It's time to grow up, get rid of this stuff." So I said, "Okay, I'm growing up now." And when they came home, he said, "What are you doing with all my baseball cards?" Right. So it was my fault. But I wasn't old enough to know. I was a minor. While we're talking about wills and estates. <laughs> That's the <laughs> other point, why you need a trust. You've got minor children, uh, grandchildren. Uh, and let me make this point. Uh, I've got a, a songwriter client, great guy, greatest guy in the world. But during his getting around years, he visited many cities and he encountered many women. And he's got some children outside of his marriage. 
when you don't have a will, all those outside children are your heirs at law equal to your children. Right. And they can get the same share as your children. Is there a right for a child to have a share of a of a, somebody's estate? Not if you write them out of the will. Or so no, you, but like a wife has a right. A wife has a right, but a spouse, a, a child does not. Right, and the, it's called a marital, but... Well, in Tennessee, again? we call it the elective share. Elective share, right. And uh, what is that elective share? Well, it's a percentage of the estate based on the years of marriage. It starts at 10% and goes up to 40%. If you've been married nine years or more, it's 40%. So no matter what the guy writes in the will, the, the current wife has a has a 40% interest in the guy's will. If they've been married nine years or so more. So how do they cut that up when the guy's given everything to somebody else? A 40% share of everything? It's a mess. Conway Twitty's estate was that situation. He didn't leave a will. And his the law then was one third. It wasn't the percentage. Right. And his wife and the children from the first marriage fought for years over how to divide the assets and how to compute right. the elective share and all those kind of things. Right. Anyway, we are just about out of time. Anyway, we're going to have you back again. We'll talk about something else. There's so much to talk about in this. I thing. know. There's Thank so much you. to talk about. And uh, the, this is Jeff Mobley. And who are these other authors? Jack Robinson is my mentor. He taught me everything I know okay. about law. He's a great, great lawyer. News Andra. Andra Hedrick worked with me and Jack. I left their firm and went out on my own a few years ago. Okay. But Andra is still there with Jack. She's a wonderful lawyer too. This is the Bible of Tennessee Wills. And it my is. guest my guest here has been Jeff Mobley and I'm Jesse Goldberg and we'll see you next week with another edition of the show.